Good morning. It's August 23rd. We're here for our Bible study for the week, and uh, this is our second to last study of the Holy Spirit. Uh, as you can see, we've been looking at living in the Holy Spirit, uh, peace, righteousness, and joy. Uh, real quick heads up, next week we'll be looking at Galatians 5, verses 22 to 23, and you're all familiar with that passage. It is Paul's list of the fruit of the Holy Spirit. So we'll be looking at that next week. And then at the end of our lesson today, I will go ahead and kind of preview what our fall schedule is going to look like. Uh, if you have your Bibles, you want to open those up to 1 Thessalonians. And we're going to be looking at chapter 1, verses 2 to 6. I'm actually going to read through verses, uh, or excuse me, through verse 10, just so that you can have the entirety of that. Um, we won't talk about the entirety of that passage. I'll just make a passing reference to that so that uh, you'll be able to uh, kind of see the context of what we're looking at. Today's lesson, Lesson 12, is entitled The Power of the Gospel. It doesn't have the reference to the Holy Spirit in the title, but there are two references to the Holy Spirit in the passage that we're going to be looking at. One on the front side of the or the presentation side of the gospel and one on the receiving end of the gospel as you will see. As we get started though, um, I want to ask you a couple of questions. First of all, uh, I think about this a lot. Uh, in fact, in one of my uh, later in life and letter of Paul class, later life and letters of Paul class, I'll ask students from time to time if Paul were to write to the church today, what would he have to say? Now, Paul wrote letters to specific churches and or to specific cities that had multiple house churches in there. And of course, most of his letters will include some kind of word of thanksgiving. Quick question for us, though, at Gamble Street Baptist Church is this. If Paul, were, uh, if Paul wrote a letter to Gamble Street Baptist Church, what would he mention in his prayers? Well, we're going to look at Paul's mentioning of the Thessalonians in his prayers, and uh, he'll remind them of the things he prays about and thinks about when he thinks of them. Uh, if you are watching and you're not a member of Gamble Street Baptist Church, you're a member of another church, or you've been part of another church, maybe you can reflect on this question with regard to that church. What would Paul say to that church? Uh, we can get a little bit more individual here as we work the lesson as well. Another question to think about is what would he be thankful for to God? Uh, in this letter, there are going to be some interesting and very, very valuable things that Paul is grateful to God for because of the Thessalonians. Uh, what would he be thankful for with, uh, with Gamble Street or with any of the churches that profess Christ in our world today? And uh, if asked, what would others report about our faith? And the reason I bring that up is one of the things that Paul is going to point out is that with regard to the Thessalonians, Word has gotten out in various regions about their faith and what's been reported about their faith. The question is, what would people say about us? Well, I want to take a moment to give a little bit of an introduction on a personal side, and then what we'll do is we'll read the passage, walk through it, and then highlight a couple of things uh, for application's sake. I have to admit that this is probably my favorite word of thanksgiving that Paul gives to any church. Uh, I had the opportunity many, many years ago, uh, about 1992 or 93, and uh, was able to preach this in Lubbock, uh, this passage in Lubbock. I preached it on another occasion, done other Bible studies. And it just amazes me the gushing emotion that Paul has uh, for the Thessalonians, not least of the reasons being the fact that their response to the gospel and the reputation that they were building uh, among the various regions in the area. And one of the things I had done in those sermons is encouraged each of the churches where I preached that passage to become like the Thessalonians, such that there would be a reputation among the peoples around them that what could be said about them is how they emulated Christ and how strong their faith was. Uh, it is probably one of the most, if not the most positive word of commendation that Paul has for a church. Uh, you'll recall that when Paul writes to the Galatians, he has no word of thanksgiving for them. In fact, he jumps right into condemnation. For the Corinthians, what I find interesting is that he's thankful to God for the Corinthians, but for what God has done for the Corinthians. Here, of course, what we're going to see is Paul's word of gratitude for what the Thessalonians have done. And you'll see that 
in other places. When we studied the letter to the Ephesians a few weeks ago, uh, we recognized that the first thing that Paul went on to do is talk about the spiritual blessings that are of the Ephesians and then for us uh, first. And then he spent some time in the, at the end of chapter one giving words of gratitude. But I hope that uh, after today you'll go back and look at this. Hopefully you'll be challenged by this. Um, what we see after Paul gives these strong words of emotion uh, in gratitude for the Thessalonians, uh, you get a hint, if not more than a hint, of why that was when you look at chapter two and the way he and Silas and Timothy conducted themselves among the Thessalonians. What I'd like to do is uh, jump into the passage. Let me read it to you. I'll be reading from the NIV and then we'll, we'll walk through it verse by verse. I've got a couple other slides that I want to share with you as we go through the text uh, and discuss certain portions of it. This is what Paul says. And I'll just begin with verse one, the opening part of it, and then we'll jump into the Thanksgiving part. It says, Paul, Silas, and Timothy to the church of the Thessalonians in God, the Father, and the Lord Jesus Christ. He says, grace and peace to you. Then notice the things that he says. We always thank God for all of you and continually mention you in our prayers, remembering before our God and Father your work produced by faith, your labor prompted by love, and your endurance inspired by hope in our Lord Jesus Christ. He says, knowing, brothers and sisters, that uh, you are loved by God and that he has chosen you, or more literally, it would say, we know your selection, the fact that God has selected them. He says, because our gospel came to you, not simply with words, and the text really is not only with words, but with power, but also with power, with the Holy Spirit and deep conviction. You know that we lived among you for your sake, or you know how we lived among you for your sake. You became imitators of us and of the Lord. For you welcomed the message in the midst of severe suffering with the joy given by the Holy Spirit. And so you became a model to all of the believers in Macedonia and Achaia. The Lord's message rang out from you, not only in Macedonia and Achaia, your faith in God has become known everywhere. Therefore, we do not need to say anything about it, for they themselves report what kind of reception you gave us. They tell how you turn to God from idols to serve the living and true God and to wait for his son from heaven, whom he raised from the dead, Jesus, who rescues us from the coming wrath. Well, I'd love to really talk about all of those passages, all of those verses, but let's go ahead and focus in first on verses two through three, then we'll look at verses four through six, and then a quick reference to seven to the end. But I just want to, 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 to highlight that for you because there's an extension of what happened among the Thessalonians that Paul is particularly um, glowing and, and thankful for. Well, the first thing we see here is that Paul has a standard word of thanksgiving. He says, I, we're thankful to God for you, remembering you always. And what is it that he remembers about them? What is it that they, meaning Paul, Silas, and Timothy, remember? Uh, as you heard the NIV, it said things like work produced by faith. Many of you are going to be reading uh, a little bit more word-for-word -word translation, and you'll see simply the phrase work of faith. Uh, Really what's going on with the word of there is it's the idea that the faith is what um, produces the work. I like what Robert Gundry says in his commentary, um, his one volume commentary on the passage. He says in each of these cases, it's the work that stems from faith, it's labor that stems from love, and it's endurance, and he says in hope, uh, which stems in hope or from hope in the uh, uh, in the Lord Jesus. What's going on? It does quite literally say work of faith, labor of love, endurance of hope. To get a little technical, these are each genitive uh, nouns, and many are going to suggest, and I think rightly so, it's that these qualities, faith, love, and hope, are the things that prompt or inspire or in, uh, in produce, or as I think Robert Gundry uh, does well, says they stem from. These are the source of this thing. So what Paul is saying is he can look at the Thessalonians and he sees the work that they're doing and they know it's a work that has been uh, brought about by the faith that they have in God. Their labor, that word labor there is a word that really means toilsome labor, hard striving work. 
what prompts that, what drives that action. It's the love that they have. And then they have an endurance of hope. What gives them the ability to endure? He says it's because of the hope that they have in Christ. And here the word hope has a confident expectation. And here and later on in the passage, the idea of, of Christ is not just Christ in their faith in him as, a, as, as their Lord, but in the, the hope, meaning the confident expectation of his return. And that is brought up near the end of the passage. We well, won't go into a lot of detail about this at this point, but you do immediately notice what's the very famous triad in Pauling literature, and that is the three words, faith, love, and hope. Of course, you're probably more familiar with the order of faith, uh, hope, and love. And uh, what we have here is in this passage, because of what Paul says was the condition under which they received the gospel, the most recent thing he'll say about them is their endurance inspired by hope. In 1 Corinthians, at the end of verse uh, chapter 12 into verse 13, he talks about these three, faith, hope, and love. And at the end of chapter 13, he puts faith, hope, and love in that order because love then becomes the theme of chapter 13 when he talks about all the things that love does and the things that love doesn't do. But uh, you'd be, I, I won't go all through all the verses right now, uh, but one of the things you might want to do is note the number of times that Paul will talk about the faith, hope, and love in that order. And sometimes it's pretty subtle. Maybe sometimes you'll see two of them together uh, or different groups of them. But notice he says that they have an endurance that is inspired um, uh, in our Lord or the hope that is in our Lord Jesus Christ. And then he says, the reason he prays this, and like I said, the NIV is going to start a new sentence here. Really, verse 4 begins with a participle that indicates the reason why they can pray these things. The reason he remembers them in this way, uh, and he focuses in on their faith, hope, and love, and the things that, that those, those qualities produce, is that they, meaning Paul, Silas, and Timothy, know, and he then goes on to say what he knows about them. He knows that they have been selected by God. He says literally your election or the election of you uh, or the selection of you. Uh, before he gets to that point though, he stops and gives a word of affection to them. He says that you are uh, children or brothers, literally brothers loved by God. Of course, the NIV is going to indicate that the word brothers there is not merely referencing uh, the male parts of the of the body of Christ there, but talking about the entire body of Christ. And so what the NIV is going to do here, what some will put in a footnote is indicate that this is inclusive of the entire congregation, but they're loved by God. He says he, he because of, he, he knows about their faith, hope, and love because he knows of their selection. And he says he knows of their selection because of four things related to the the proclamation of the gospel. And what I want to show you in working on this, uh, these few verses here is point out the four things that uh, Paul talks about that comprise the presentation of the gospel. Let me read the text a little bit again to you, and then I'll point out these parts. He says, for we know, brothers and sisters, loved by God, that he has chosen you or that you are select. In verse five, he says, because our gospel came to you, not simply, and really the word there is the word only, not only with words, but with power also, with the Holy Spirit and deep conviction. Um, let's look at those four things real quickly. First, he says, yes, it did come with words. In other words, they spoke the gospel. This is the word that really gets at the idea of the spoken word. Uh, but Paul says it's not merely or not only with words. Uh, at this point, he's going to go on and talk about the word power, Holy Spirit, and deep conviction. Before we do that, I just want you to think about what Paul said to the Corinthians about not speaking fine sounding words or using high rhetoric to share the gospel. He says here, yes, there was a verbal explanation or presentation of the gospel, but he goes, it wasn't just words, not only words, but also. And it's that, but also that we need to pay attention to because he says, yes, words were involved, but there were three other components that were involved. And he says that first is power. When you think of the word power here, I think it's going to be very important that you think about the fact that when in the book of Acts, following the pattern of Jesus himself, whenever there was a proclamation, it was accompanied by some kind of signs or wonders. There was power that 
accompany that as evidence of the truthfulness of the gospel. And you can see through the book of Acts where that's present. Um, you can see reference to this in other parts of Paul's letters as well. Uh, again, time doesn't allow to go through all of those texts, but let me give you a couple of verses to think about uh, where Paul joins the idea of power with the idea of presenting the gospel with words. Uh, write these down, and you can go back and look at these on your own. But go back and look at 1 Corinthians chapter 2, verses 4 and 5. I had just alluded to that passage a moment ago. Then look also at 2 Corinthians chapter 12, verse 12. And then you can also look at Galatians chapter 3, verse 5. And the point there is power, recognizing that there were signs or wonders or some kind of power um, experiences. And I don't want to use the word experience there as some kind of mystical, um, personal kind of thing, but something that was objective to all people watching, that there might have been some kind of, of miraculous event that occurred that accompanied that. So Paul is saying, when Paul, Silas, and Timothy, and others uh, traveled through Macedonia and they made their way to Thessalonica, he said, we preach to you words, but it wasn't just words. Not only words, but also the, the gospel, he says, our gospel preached to you came with power. Of course, our focus is on the Holy Spirit, and Paul is going to be very clear that we also have the Holy Spirit. He says it was the Holy Spirit that was accompanying that and giving power. And we've made allusion to this and, and sometimes direct reference to this as well, that uh, the Holy Spirit is very prominent in the book of Acts. And it's by the power of the Holy Spirit that they spoke boldly, that they were able to do these wonders and that gave proclamation to the gospel. And then lastly, uh, I'm gonna give you a very wooden translation here. It literally is much full assurance. Now it's two words, it's the word poly, meaning much or great. And then the word that means full assurance or full confidence. Uh, the NIV says deep conviction. And I think what this has to do with is that with this compound idea of much full assurance is that it was full assurance, but greatly fully assured. In other words, I think conviction is a good word in the sense that Paul was believing the truthfulness of the gospel. And so what he says is that when they presented the gospel to the Thessalonians, it came in these four parts. Now, that doesn't mean that these four parts would be referencing every time Paul preached the gospel. I do want us to first and foremost recognize that he is speaking specifically to the Thessalonians at this point. But certainly, as I mentioned, with the idea of power and the Holy Spirit, you know, there are going to be other times when, when that is there. We just see it all uh, grouped together in this passage. He says, so not only with words, but also with power, with the Holy Spirit, and with full assurance or much full assurance. So that's Paul talking to the Thessalonians about, from their perspective, meaning Paul, Silas, and Timothy, the perspective of them as they preach the gospel. He knows they're chosen. He knows that they are loved by God because he can see that they, uh, that Paul and Silas and Timothy preach the gospel with this fourfold component to it. But the other thing that Paul does is he recognizes and acknowledges that that's not the only thing that the, Th the Thessalonians observed about you know, hearing the gospel. Um, he goes on to say, just as or even as uh, you know what sort of people or what sort of men we were or what sort of men we became among you while we were among you and for your sake. I won't take time to go into a lot of detail about what's going on in that text, other than to say this, that sometimes your translations are going to start a new sentence. But what's going on in that clause is Paul is using a, a comparative conjunction here, uh, making a transition that he's saying, while we recognize that the gospel came not only with words, but with power and the Holy Spirit and full assurance or much full assurance, even as you know that uh, what kind of people we became or what sort of people we were that when we were among you. And what he's acknowledging is that the Thessalonians recognized it wasn't just the words that they heard and some of the miracles perhaps they had seen that convinced them of the gospel. It was also the way Paul, Silas, and Timothy conducted themselves in their midst and for their sake. 
Uh, I would love to go through in a little bit more detail with some of the background language that's used here, but there are three times that the word for become is used, and many of your translations are going to translate them three different ways. It's going to talk about the gospel coming to them. That's one use of the word. Uh, some of your translations are going to use the second word here, the second occurrence, where it says uh, what sort of people uh, we became among you or proved to be among you, but it's the same word. I'll use the word. It's the word genomai, but it means that the, the, the gospel came to them. Uh, they personally became the sort of people uh, that they could emulate. And then we're going to see the third use, and it's the more typical use of the word. Once the Thessalonians received the gospel, something changed in them as well. And so uh, let me put that slide up real quick and show you what it was then. You see from Paul's perspective, the fourfold elements of the gospel uh, in the presentation of the gospel. And then what we see are two things that represent the uh, reception of the gospel by the Thessalonians. First, it said, Paul says, you know what sort of people we became among you and for your sake. And so what he's acknowledging is that the Thessalonians recognized the lives of Paul and others. And I say the others because clearly whenever Paul is using the first person plural here, he's referring to Silas and Timothy that were along with him during this time. Now let me make a quick time out here because I might let it slip out of the way and, and not go and mention it. I think good background passage for you to look at is going to be in Acts chapter 17, where there is the record of Paul and the others going in and uh, preaching the gospel in Thessalonica. Another reason to uh, look at that passage is because it gives a hint of some of the temptation, or I should say the, the tribulation or the persecution, um, the affliction they encountered uh, while they were there, not just Paul, Silas, and Timothy, but those that began to believe in the gospel when those Jews that did not believe in Jesus were following Paul around and seeking to find ways to accuse him and condemn him, they went after some of the people who believed in Thessalonica, and one particular person was Jason. In fact, he ended up being persecuted even more uh, by these, these non-believing Jews because at some point um, he had befriended and housed Paul, Silas, and Timothy. And so there is that persecution that's occurring. Now, the book of Acts there doesn't tell us more about what took place. In fact, it just tells us that Paul and the others were there for a few weeks and then they left. Paul is writing this letter back to the Thessalonians, probably during his stay in Corinth. And that's evident from the fact the way Paul will use the phrases Macedonia and Achai. But one of the things that Paul is going to say is in your reception of the gospel, one, you did it not only because you heard the message, but you also recognized the way we lived or the kind of people we were among you. And then next, he talks about the attitude with which they received the gospel. And that is that they received it with or in much affliction or tribulation. And that didn't stop them from doing it. And it's going to be that kind of thing that's going to provide uh, the means by which or the foundation on which they're going to be examples themselves to other people. Well, as I said, on the one hand, Paul speaking from his perspective about the gospel is talking about the presentation of the gospel, but it wasn't just the presentation of the gospel that led the, the Thessalonians to Christ. Part of what led them to Christ was the life that Paul lived among them. And, and if I could just stop down at this point, I would challenge you to go back and look at the letters of Paul. You can certainly look at the book of Acts, but look at the letters of Paul and note the number of times he references the way he lived his life among them. Now, one, of course, he will recognize or help them seek to recognize that uh, he was blameless in the way he lived his life. He lived above reproach and there was no way that they could accuse him of anything. Uh, he makes that plain in his farewell discourse um, in uh, Miletus when he talks to the the leaders of Ephesus in Acts chapter 20. He will remind them of the way he lived his life. And so the reason I bring all of that up, I know you've heard this famous statement, you know, always be preaching the gospel and when necessary use words. Paul doesn't separate those. It's clear that the proclamation of the gospel requires words, but those words have to be accompanied 
by the life. And I think a lot of times uh, our witness is uh, betrayed when we speak the words, but we don't live the life. And that's going to prompt me to offer some questions near the end with regard to our own witness when we get there. But I want you to see the, the, two, the, the two perspectives from which Paul is bringing up this, this idea of the presentation of the gospel. Certainly the presentation with words and all the other accompanying components. But then he also acknowledges that the thing that convinced or came to convince the Thessalonians was the way that Paul and the others conducted themselves among them. And that's important because what is said next is that the Thessalonians then went on to become imitators of Paul and the others. And not only imitators of Paul, but imitators of the Lord. And I always love looking at that word imitators because, you know, we get a lot of our English words from these various Greek words. They don't always share the same meaning. But the word for imitator here is the word from which we get our word mimic. And that's the idea of doing exactly what they see somebody else do. Uh, clearly in English, though, the word mimic tends to be a negative thing, but that's not what's going on here. In fact, this is something that Paul is actually commending them for you became imitators of us and of the Lord. Now here he doesn't call them to imitate him. He'll do that in other places. And you can look at other places in the New Testament where Paul will talk about, you know, imitate me uh, even as I imitate Christ. Or he'll say, follow my example, even as I follow the example of Christ. And so what you're going to see there is Paul acknowledging how important the way he lived his life was and I think that's important because there are other times he had to appeal to other people to be convinced by looking at his life. Here, he simply acknowledges that that's what the Thessalonians did. They acknowledged his truthfulness by the way he and Paul, or by he, he and Silas and Timothy actually lived their lives and conducted themselves uh, among them. So he says, you received the word with great affliction, but he also says, and I didn't put this up on the uh, the screen. I moved the screen down before I, I went on to this third point. But he says the third thing is that they did it with joy of the Holy Spirit. So as I said a moment ago, when Paul talks about the presentation of the gospel, a very key component here is the Holy Spirit. Paul also acknowledges that on the receiving end, that it was joy that came through the Holy Spirit. Or I could put it this way, it is because of the Holy Spirit that they could have such joy in their affliction. He's not denying that there was affliction, that there was tribulation that accompanied their receiving of the gospel, but he says that itself was also accompanied with joy, but it's the joy of the Holy Spirit, and uh, it's, holy, it's, it's the joy that the Holy Spirit can provide uh, in this difficult time. And so you can see while we use the, the reference to the Holy Spirit in salvation when we looked at Ephesians, I, I really think we can see it here within the proclamation of the gospel, both on the presentation side and on the receiving side, how the Holy Spirit was working in the entirety here or in this whole process. So again, they became imitators of Paul, the others, and the Lord. They had received the word in great affliction, but also with joy. So it's not denying the hard times. In fact, what you, can, what you can look at if you look at other parts of the book of Acts and in Colossians, one particular person from Thessalonica comes out time and time again, and that's Aristarchus. There are a couple of others that are referenced when Paul is in Corinth. Uh, you'll see some others that have come down from Macedonia, particularly Thessalonica, and they, their work continues. And so what we see there then is Paul about to talk about the example that they have left for others being played out in the way then Paul sees them working with him and among them in different regions in the Aegean area, both on the east side and the west side of the Aegean. So what does that mean? He is acknowledging their true reception of the gospel. He acknowledges that they have received it with great affliction, but also with joy, joy that can only be provided by the Holy Spirit. Again, I'll call your attention to Acts chapter 17. And uh, basically the first half of, of chapter 17, as Paul is making his way through Macedonia down into uh, the region of Achaia, as he's making his way to Athens and then Corinth. So what happens? We mentioned that there was a result among 
the, uh, the Thessalonians. And let me just bring that up again. There's the Holy Spirit, reference to the joy in the Holy Spirit. And then what were the results? I've already mentioned these. Let me just touch on them real quickly. He became, or the, the, the Thessalonians became imitators of Paul, his co-workers, and the Lord. And then they also became examples to other believers. And, and this is where I want to stop down and talk for a moment, and then we'll be done. But what you're seeing happening here is something that Paul will bring up to Timothy later in his life. We see Paul living out the gospel, both in word and deed, that having an impact on the Thessalonians, such that they begin to imitate Paul and the Lord, and in such a way as they themselves start to become an example for others. Uh, when Paul says, you have become an example to others, he's using the word tupoi, or tupos, the singular, but it's the word that we get our word type from. But it's also a word that is used in the Greek that means leaving an impression. It was like that impression that was left by the signet ring uh, in the wax, such that it became a model uh, or a mold, if you will. And so there's that impression that's left. That's the same kind of word, for instance, that Paul will use in, uh, uh, I think it's in 1 Timothy, where he says, you need to become an example, Paul tells Timothy, becoming an example, even though you are young. And he is to be an example in life and love and so forth. That's the same word that is used here. The Thessalonians became imitators of Paul and the Lord, and then in turn became examples or types or the model that others were to follow. And what we see there then is a little bit of the pattern that Paul brings up to Timothy later in 2 Timothy when he says, to take the things that I, Paul, have taught you, Timothy, to entrust to other faithful followers who will then teach others. And you see that fourfold uh, or that four generational model, which then would carry on into perpetuity if each generation would pass on to the next generation. And we see that being played out very literally among the Thessalonians. They became imitators of Paul and the Lord and in turn became examples to others. So we see the impact of their faith on others. And what then gets played out in verses 7 through 10 is the fact that word is going out how not only were the Thessalonians examples to those in Macedonia, which is the region in which they lived, but also in Achai. And Achai is where Paul is at, the prop, at that time writing a letter. Achai is that region that encompassed Athens and Corinth. But he goes on to say, you are not examples not only among Macedonia and Achai, your faith is being known everywhere. It's ringing out and spreading out everywhere so that it was a faith that was known not only in their city, but also the region and then the accompanying regions. And then Paul even goes so, so, so far as to say, your faith has been known everywhere, such that others are reporting back to Paul about what's going on among the Thessalonians so that Paul doesn't even need to tell others. They've already been telling him the kind of impact that their faith has. I think it's compounded in a positive way because they have done this while enduring affliction and tribulation. But what's to, what has sustained them? What has sustained them is the joy that can come through the Holy Spirit. So I do want to spend a, a moment just to kind of reiterate the role of the Holy Spirit here. The role of the Holy Spirit, as has been played out in other passages, in presenting the gospel, but the role of the Holy Spirit in providing the joy necessary for them to continue in living out the gospel in their own lives, even in difficult times. One of the reasons I like this passage so much is because it not only is a word of commendation to a church that in many places later will receive brief rebuke for the way they've misinterpreted some of Paul's teaching about the second coming of the Lord, but also because I think what Paul is doing here in providing these words of commendation to the Thessalonians is even as they become a pattern in their own time and in their own region, they really are setting a timeless example, example for us. Now, I'll say it this way, we are going to leave an impression. The question is, is it going to be a positive or a negative impression? Uh, one of the things we know from the book of Acts chapter 17 is that when Paul, Silas, and Timothy went into Thessalonica, there were those that followed them. And when they went in, these Jews that went in to follow them to start to stir up trouble among the people in the city that Paul was visiting, 
this particular case, Thessalonica, the religious leaders, these Jewish leaders, refer to Paul and these others as those who are turning the world upside down. Now, when we hear that phrase from the King James, we always use it in a very positive way. We say, look, they turned the world upside down. The reality, though, is that this is a word that really means they're causing dissension. They're being troublemakers. They're stirring up trouble. And that's the same word that is used later in the book of Acts, describing the fact that Paul and others are, are causing this trouble. It's the same word that's used, for instance, when they go into Ephesus and they're accused of, of, of stirring up dissension and trouble. Yes, I do think it's a positive thing when there's that kind of impression that is left that we go, we can't go unnoticed. But the reality is that the perspective of the Jews at that point, who were opposed to Paul, saw that, quote, impression in a negative way. What Paul is being, uh, has been saying here to the Thessalonians is, you have been an example in a positive way. The word is getting out on you, and we hear about your faith. The word about your faith is spreading. And so what I'm thinking of in these terms is, the Thessalonians were a very positive example. They were leaving an example not only in Macedonia and Achai, the word about their faith was ringing out all over the place in all regions. And so what I think Paul is doing there and commending them is now setting kind of the tone for us as a local church, for us as a body of Christ universally. What is the impression that we're leaving? Let me give you an analogy of what this might look like if Paul were writing something today. Say Paul visits Tarrant County, that would be Macedonia, and we'll say Fort Worth. Thessalonica was a major city, Fort Worth's a major city, and he starts a church. So there's this church plant. And not long after Paul establishes the church and then moves on, makes his way eastward, for instance, to Dallas County and the city of Dallas, we'll make the analogy fit that he goes down to Athens and then into Corinth. Part of me wants to keep the analogy going with Dallas and Corinth, but Corinth was in a league all its own in a most negative way. And while we want to talk about Dallas as a worldly city, clearly Dallas is nothing like what Corinth was known to be in the ancient world. But let's keep the analogy going. And then you can make your own conclusions about that. The point that I'm making here is Paul is referring to the Thessalonians and the impact that they had such that this small church plant in Fort Worth had immediate positive impact and became a model for other believers in Tarrant County. Not just Tarrant County, but word is getting out to them in Macedonia and all the surrounding counties. Now I picked those two counties because they're the biggest counties. No knock on the, the neighboring county of Johnson County to Tarrant County or to Denton County in the north or to Parker County in the west, but I promise you uh, Burleson was nothing like Corinth Mineral Wells was nothing like Corinth, and Denton was nothing like Corinth. Uh, the, the closest we can have, and even that's not very close, is Dallas being like Corinth. But hopefully you're getting the analogy. The small, quote, startup church plant immediately starts to have an impact, and word spreads about them. Well, let's bring that home a little bit closer. We see a couple of things taking place in this text. We see Paul and the example that he left for the Thessalonians, and they pick up on it. They become imitators of Paul, and then they themselves become a model for other believers. And as I said, there were times when Paul not only left an example for them to imitate, there were times when he actually commanded other believers to imitate him. Always, of course, with the, the, the qualification that they follow his example as he follows that of Christ. The question then has to do with us individually, but then also with regard to us as a church. And so let's look at this final slide and think of some words of application here. A couple of questions. There are people going around commending the Thessalonians for their faith. Paul is commending them in this letter to them. Who would you recommend people emulate in living out the Christian faith? Now, I've got another question in a moment, but the reason I ask this one first is most of the time we don't want to commend ourselves. We want to think of somebody else. If we were to say this person or that person is the kind of person you should follow, that you should look after, that you should imitate, that you should emulate, who in your life do you think that would be? 
We always want to prop up our pastor, and I think that's wise. Um, I think there are other members of our church that we could do that with. Maybe it's someone not in our church uh, that you know that's been in, in, had an impact on you. Who would you recommend that people emulate in living out the Christian life? Obviously, we want to be imitators of the Lord Jesus, and Paul said that's what the Thessalonians were, but he also indicated they're um, imitating him. Here's a more sobering question. Could you or I invite someone to imitate us individually in the way that we live out our Christian faith and life? Paul is telling the Thessalonians, you're a model. Uh, you're someone to follow. You followed our example. You followed the Lord's example. Uh, and now you've become an example. Could we comfortably say, I want someone to follow my example? Now, if I were to ever say that at this point, I would say I would put heavy, heavy qualifications on what Paul says regarding the fact that he would ask them to imitate him as he imitated Christ. To the degree that I am imitating and emulating Christ, then certainly those are qualities you would find. I know that I have a long way to go, and many of you would be very gracious to try and say wonderful things about me, but I would still be hesitant to say, follow my example. Um, I've been asked a time or two to be someone's mentor, and uh, I've done it. I always feel very inadequate in doing that, but I've always received you know, very w strong words of confidence from people around me in encouraging me to be a mentor. Uh, but I always feel uneasy about that because I feel like I always need to be mentored myself. And I think some of you are going to be in the same boat in, in terms of your own mindset, even though I could point at each of you right now and say, you'd be a great mentor, you'd be a great mentor. Uh, we would, I'd love to see people following your example. But I do think there's a place for our humility at that point to say, I'm hesitant to have someone follow my example. Uh, Paul never does say that in a boastful way to follow his example. He acknowledges when it happens um, and he does say when it should happen. But think about that. Are the kinds of things Paul is saying here something that we could take on ourselves? So let me stop that for a second and come up with a couple of other things. Uh, related to Gambrel Street specifically, or again, if you're watching from another church, uh, your own church or other churches that you're aware of. Uh, if we were to make Gambrel Street Thessalonica, the church in Thessalonica, um, what do we need to do to be examples in Tarrant County such that word is heard throughout Dallas? One of the things that we've said about uh, Gambrel Street is that we want to be a regional type church, that there would be people coming from all over the, the county, maybe from other places. Already, you know, I live in Arlington and drive to Fort Worth when we meet. There are others that live in Johnson County. We see some people from Haltom City. We've seen people drive from Weatherford um, and other places uh, throughout the, the, the region to come to Gamble Street. So in, in some ways we are um, living that out, but I've, of course there are other opportunities that we have. What kind of reputation do we want Gambrel Street to have? Certainly, I would say that as we look at what Paul has to say the, to the Thessalonians, we would want to emulate the Thessalonians to the extent that they emulate Christ and that they are models of faithfulness and joy by way of the Holy Spirit to others. And so I just want to challenge us uh, to do that. The question I would have then is, even as Paul recognized the words being spread about Thessalonica, it gets back to one of the questions I asked at the beginning. If we were to think about what was said of the Thessalonians among the different peoples in that region, a sobering question could be, if word were out about Gambrel Street, what would that word be? What do we want that word to be? We certainly want it to be a word that these are faithful people, that they are uh, loved by God, that they exhibit a work of love, or excuse me, a work of faith, uh, a toil of love, a labor of love, and a, a, a hope that produces a, a, a confidence or a confidence uh, that produces perseverance in difficult times. Uh, I do think there's a lot for us to look at the Thessalonians. Again, there are going to be some doctrinal issues that Paul has to correct with them um, that they need to, to be further enlightened on. But one of the things that we recognize is that they're 
they're faithful to the Lord. As word spreads about Gambrel Street and about the members of the church, about us individually, what are they saying? What do we want them to say? What do we have to do as a body of believers to have a reputation such that Paul could write to Gambrel Street what he was writing in these opening words of praise and thanksgiving to the Thessalonians? Well, I want to challenge you in that. I know I need to challenge myself in that. Let's have a word of prayer, and then I'll say a brief word about next week and then our next study. Father, Ray, I thank you for this day. I thank you for, again, the work of Paul as your missionary theologian to preach the gospel wherever he went. And Father, then to follow up with uh, these words of commendation or correction, as the case would be, whenever he would need to do that in these churches. I just thank you that not only did he set an example for others, but in the writing of these letters, he has set us an example uh, of how we need to live our lives by what he commended in the Thessalonians. Lord, I do pray that we would take to heart the things that Paul said to them and, and then take to heart the, uh, the example that the Thessalonians were around the region. I do pray for Gambrel Street, Father. I pray for our church, for each of our members, that uh, even now as we are kind of spread out separate places, uh, that we would continue to be a witness. And then when we gather together, that there would be a light shine from, from the, the building and from our lives, uh, that uh, the reputation of Gambrel Street would be that we are a people who um, work and labor and endure because of our, uh, our faith, love, and hope. And, and that, that we would be people who imitate you, who follow the example of your word, and then that love the world to the extent that we want them to know the gospel and to know uh, you in personal relationship. We know we have a ways to go. I'm thankful for the many members that are way, way ahead in that area that are people that I can personally look up to. And Lord, I just pray that you will continue to guide us by your spirit uh, to be all that you want us to be. And we love you and praise you and ask now that as we get ready to gather for worship, you will be honored uh, solely. Uh, and singularly this morning. We pray all this in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, as I said, next week we're going to be looking at Galatians chapter 5, verses 22 to 23. We're going to be looking at the fruit of the Spirit, and that's going to be our last lesson for the summer on living in the Holy Spirit. We're going to be looking at the letter to the Philippians, and I hope I can get this where there's not a lot of glare, but we're going to be looking at the letter to the Philippians in the fall, and the title is going to be Pure Joy a choice to rejoice. And this is going to be another opportunity for us to go through an entire book of the New Testament verse by verse. So in the 12 or 13 lessons that we have for the fall, we will be able to cover uh, all four chapters of the book or the letter to the Philippians. It's a big week. I know that we, for some of you, there's, you know, the school has started. Uh, many others are starting this week. And uh, as we do, even though there are other things going on, uh, we're concerned about COVID. We're concerned about other things that are taking place in the world. The reality is it's a new week and every week brings its own challenges. I'll just say that I pray for you as the week begins and look forward to when we will be able to see each other again next week and very much looking forward to when in a few weeks we will be able to see each other in person. And I've already promised that uh, you need to be aware of the emotion that you may see from me as we gather together. It's been a long time. And uh, even now, just thinking about it, uh, I'm going to rejoice being able to see each of you face to face. Um, I'll say it here. I'll say it then. I love you guys. I miss you guys. And I look forward to seeing you very soon. Have a good week. God bless you. Bye-bye.